Astrophotography, or photographing the stars, requires some careful planning and preparation. First, you need a camera with a decent sensor and glass. Well, okay, any DSLR with kit lens made in the last 10 years will do, and then even some smartphone cameras can produce great images if they have a wide enough aperture and a long exposure capability. Next, you need to find the right spot, usually at least an hour away from any developed city with a clear view of dark sky looking southward. The most brilliant part of the Milky Way is always in the southern sky for those of us living in the northern hemisphere, despite what a lot of very scummy Instagram frauds would have you believe. But getting away from civilization isn't all that you need to do. You'll also have to make sure your shooting time is right, mid-spring to early fall, and on a night when the light from the moon won't interrupt your exposure, preferably on the new moon if you can manage it. And let's not forget about weather. Every star shooter has had unexpected clouds ruin their trip, so a clear forecast is essential, even though it's no guarantee. This is all pretty basic stuff for the hobbyists, and if you clicked on this video, you probably already knew all of that. But some of you who have been taking star picks for years may still have some questions. Like, should I upgrade to something newer? Does brand make a difference? Or should I go get an Astromod done? All right, let me say up front, I'm not going to be able to give you a complete answer in this video. But I did recently have access to five distinct camera models for a weekend, and I really wanted to share what I learned from going out to shoot the same Starry Horizon with all five. The models included in this shootout are, starting with my first photography camera, the Canon EOS Rebel T3i, my current travel camera, the Sony A6500, Canon's first full-frame mirrorless camera, the Canon EOS R, and its successor, the Canon EOS R6. Just for fun, I'll also be throwing in the Canon EOS 6D since they had one lying around in the shop. For this to be a fair comparison, I had to make sure to match settings as closely as possible. Each of the Canon cameras were fitted with everyone's first kit lens, the trusty old EFS 18-55mm, with the exception of the 6D which doesn't accept EFS lenses. Now that actually puts that camera at a bit of a handicap because the only lens I had available for it was the EF 24 to 105 millimeter, which is limited to f4 at the widest, compared to the kit lens at f3.5. Still, the images it produced were comparable in framing. For the Sony, I used my 16 millimeter pancake lens, which opens up to f2.8, but I simply kept it at f3.5 to level the playing field. Now one thing I should make you aware of first off is that one of these cameras has had the sensor modified for astrophotography. That's the EOS R. For those who may not know, that just means the protective coating applied to every consumer camera sensor to block UV and IR light has been carefully removed. The advantage here is that for night shots, especially looking at nebulas through a telescope, more of the light hidden to the eye is able to be captured. The drawback being that you will need an in-body filter applied to effectively use this when shooting in daylight from now on. Otherwise, everything will just have odd shades of pink and magenta. Having this camera in the shootout won't tell us much about the EOS R straight out of the box, but it does give us some valuable insight into how modified cameras work. With that being said, let's get straight into the results. Each of the images here was shot at ISO 6400 with an exposure time of 20 seconds and a white balance value of 5200K. These are the raw images. No post-processing has been applied whatsoever with the exception of some white balance adjustments for the EOS R due to its modified sensor. Before I tell you which camera is which, take a second to determine which image you like the best. Do you prefer brighter, more saturated, more contrast? You decide. Okay, starting from the left is the T3i. I'd have to say this one is obviously the noisiest of the five, but it's honestly not that bad. For someone just getting started with astrophotography, this isn't a terrible starter camera. With this being a raw image, there's still a lot you can get out of this photo after some editing. Next we have the Canon 6D. This camera is nearly as old as the T3i, but from a higher product line. Because of the f4 aperture, this one comes out looking a little darker than the others. But take a closer look here. Every other image in this roundup has some amount of chromatic aberration, but with the 6D and that EF 24-105mm to lens, there's no aberration to speak of. This is actually an excellent demonstration of what you can get out of spending a little more for a higher quality lens. Up next is the A6500. If you know me, you know I've become a Sony guy, so you may think I'm biased when I say I actually liked this image best of all. It isn't the brightest of the bunch, but it is capturing a lot of light in spite of it being a crop sensor. Most of all for me, this just has more detail and especially relevant contrast right out of the gate. The lights and darks in the gas clouds are more pronounced than the other images, and you can see more color separation from the nebula to the empty night sky. This next one you may have already guessed by its color and exposure. 
Yep, it's the modified EOS R. There is no denying it, for the same exposure time and ISO value, you are definitely getting way more light captured with the modified sensor. And just as we expected, more gas cloud is visible to this camera than the others. One thing you'll notice though is that where every other image has this hillside captured in an orange hue from the distant lights, this hillside is green. Believe it or not, that's thanks to the UV light that this camera picks up now. A quick and dirty edit to try to bring this image closer to what I would typically do with my Milky Way images shows that even when you get close to the same colors in the sky, that green is here to stay, and even elevated in other places like here on the horizon, where electromagnetic interference in the atmosphere is also being captured with higher fidelity. Still, there's no denying that you could get a lot out of images captured in this format when it comes to the cloudy areas, especially when you start to stack photos like this one. That just leaves us with our last camera, the EOS R6. Some of you probably picked this as your favorite of the group. I am definitely impressed by how little vignetting occurred with this camera, even though it was using the same cheap kit lens as the others. It's also the brightest capture of the non-modified cameras. I have to say I was maybe just a little bit disappointed that this didn't outright blow away the rest of the competition when it came to detail, with it being a pretty new camera. But in certain areas, you can definitely see the superior detail from this full frame sensor. There's plenty of data to work with in this image. So if you're thinking about getting into astrophotography but you don't want to break the bank, you can definitely start with a secondhand Rebel at a very low price and still have a lot of fun with it. Now if you're someone who has been shooting with something like the Rebel for a really long time, I'd encourage you to look into what some of these newer mirrorless cameras might be able to do to enhance your photography portfolio. The other takeaways here are that lenses really can make a difference and that modified sensors may or may not be for you. After doing this experiment, I personally don't think I'll be modifying any of my cameras, but if you decide to go for it, let me know about your experience. I'd be interested to see what some of you were able to do with it. Hope you found this video informative. Let me know if there's anything else I should have mentioned or included in my test. It's not unlikely that I'd do something like this again in the future. Catch you guys on the next one.